We have 18 months to develop our so. Hello everyone. This week, I am bringing you a seasoned professional from the maritime and shipping industry with over 25 years of experience. So with that then, I would like to kindly welcome Mr. Zoran Lajic. Mr. Lajic is currently the Energy Efficiency Director at the Angelikousis Group, whilst he has also served in the organization as the Head of Fleet Performance. Now, a very small parenthesis here. For those unfamiliar with the shipping industry and the Angelikousis name, Ms. Maria Angelikousis, the CEO and owner of the group, is one of the biggest closely held ship owners in the world and the richest individual in Greek shipping. Closing that parenthesis, Mr. Logic has previously served as the head of fleet performance at Maran Tankers Management, as a senior performance engineer at Thenamaris, and was a lead vessel performance analyst and subsequent general manager for the AP Moller Mars Group in Denmark. Overall, he has 25 years of experience in the shipping and maritime industry, mainly dedicated to establishing and structuring energy efficiency slash fleet performance departments. This interview dived into the complete journey of Mr. Logic from his very first role back in 1998 in ITS Sasa as a naval architect until today. But most importantly, this interview focuses on the key outtakes, which are how Mr. Logic made decisions along his career, how he made decisions and strategized to obtain role growth, how he responsibly was able to undertake the duty of structuring maritime departments within organizations, and also, very importantly, and that's a very big outtake from this interview, what the young generation of aspiring professionals who want to enter the maritime industry should know before even applying to a role. As always, I want to close this introduction with my personal thoughts about the interview, which are, first of all, a very deep appreciation for Mr. Logic's time to enlighten me and you guys with his extensive experience. Um, I believe it's one thing to just see somebody's CV, understand how they developed for, from like role to role and company to company and organization to organization. It's a whole different ballpark having them explain to you specifically how they strategized, how they thought, how they decided to move from company to company, why they did so. And there is another trap that we young people fall into uh, all the time. We see senior people in senior positions and we just think this is the natural occurrence of things that if we are 50 or 60 years old, and most likely we will end up in the senior position as well because we all think we are aspiring individuals and dedicated to our craft and what we've studied. This is not generally true. A lot of people don't end up in these positions. So interviews like this just make you understand and appreciate what it actually takes to end up in such a senior position. The most important things about the interviews I do is that it just explains to you plainly and simply what it really took for these individuals to end up where they are. I don't want to waste any more of your time. Enjoy uh, this incredible interview. I believe it's a must watch for every single aspiring young professional who wants to enter the maritime world. to get to know you as a person as well would be about your educational background. Basically, what was that that propelled you towards mar maritime engineering, mechanical engineering and naval architecture? Why did you want to do that? Yeah, uh, basically, OK, this starts when I was a kid, of course. <laughs> so um, my my mom, she was um, a teacher in uh, how they call it, um, it is uh, uh, high school, but how mm -hmm. they say, C, uh, junior high school. Junior high school. Uh, yeah, so she was a teacher of uh, physics and chemistry. And she got to work in one village next to my hometown. And this village uh, was uh, on the river. So I used to play on that river. 
and uh, basically um, this river didn't have such a you know high traffic but uh, the ships were coming from time to time and it was very interesting to see them you know those ships were inland ships that's why how i start liking them and then of course i used to go to to vacation in croatia where i could basically the, the basic idea what i wanted what i was asking my parents to go to a place like split or something like there where is a harbor or the mm -hmm. area where you could see the ships not to go to some island where the ships are not passing by and then the old american movies like uh, i like them all those movies with captains and you know that there was one movie with john wayne when he he, he was a captain uh, on the sailing ship and he wanted to get um, to be a captain on on the steamship you know and it was very exciting and in the owner he had the the models of all the ships and there were some um, some bad people some bandits whatever and uh, they managed to uh, to sink some of their ships in some way they want to rob them and then mm -hmm. uh, if they stay without ship they will take the model of the ship and uh, throw into the fire place <laughs> and for me it was so nice like ah this guy is owner he has all those ships plus the models of those ships this is how he started uh, plus to be honest mm -hmm. uh, besides those uh, kids things uh, also in my hometown um, uh, the, there was a shipyard actually at some point two shipyards because my hometown is on the river it, it is basically is not on the sea it is uh, north of Serbia so it is Pannonian um, flat i think this is a proper mm -hmm. word uh, uh, and basically you don't have sea but you have big rivers so there was a shipyard at some point two shipyards building um, inland ships uh, coastal ships um, tugboats uh, etc so somehow it was also something that i liked and it was also in my hometown basically so it's a very genuine uh, child's dream first of all it's you yes. didn't just do it out of necessity you were always dreaming you were you always liked interacting with uh, ships and vessels um so after your uh, initial studies in 1998 i want you to talk to me about your first uh, touch with the industry working for its sasa so how was your yes. experience as a naval architect yeah basically uh, that was um very frustrating period. I was very, very frustrated. And basically, that's why I learned to appreciate a chance to work on a project, on a real project. Because basically, the name of this is, um, I, I didn't want uh, to put in my uh, CV what is uh, the real name, because the, the real name sounds very, I, I would say, it's, it's a big name because it is Institute of Technical Sciences of uh, Serbian Academy of Science and Arts, mm -hmm. which is uh, the highest um, scientific institution there, basically. So it is above universities. And uh, this institute uh, has been uh, made uh, something like 1945, 46, just after World War II, because they wanted to intensify uh, inland uh, transportation so they said okay there is a big potential in in, in yugoslavia uh, for moving uh, the goods on the river so idea was they said okay why instead of to build all the roads now after the war let's use the rivers because you could go you know from uh, sava river danube you can connect on sava basically uh, go from Zagreb in Croatia all the way to Belgrade and then from Belgrade to go to the Black Sea. So it was like a sort of highway. And then they said, how to do it? Let's make an institute and uh, let's pay some guys to go, uh, send them to go to US to see what Americans are doing because they learned that Americans are a bit in that time. They were more advanced than Europeans. They had push boats uh, that were pushing the barges instead of Europeans who had the uh, uh, those tugboats um, uh, towing the barges. Plus, Americans already started using uh, uh, duct propellers and coupling mm -hmm. propeller. And in case of uh, Europeans, they still had uh, pedal wheelers, uh, which was a really old system. And this is how it started. And this institute, they had they only at the beginning uh, they they had some money from the state, but mm -hmm. since they had a lot of uh, shipyards in Yugoslavia. 
uh, they were dealing okay not so much with the big shipyards in uh, in in Croatia because in Croatia were huge shipyards in the past building big ships in uh, in Serbia on the rivers especially north of Serbia uh, they had uh, smaller shipyards building um, inland ships tugboats coastal ships so basically they had a chance to make contracts with all those shipyards to help them so they had, they had enough money and then they even supported other departments like new materials whatever mm -hmm. and then <laughs> during the 90s uh, it's happened in yugoslavia what's happened uh, there was some crazy war uh, end of uh, yugoslavia mm -hmm. and uh, this institute they they still um, didn't understand that there is no this industry that there are no big uh, uh, inland ship owners because in the past they had very big i mean several big big ship owners especially one in in, in belgrade uh, so we were trying to make so many projects proposals to help them to increase efficiency of the fleet but they almost even didn't have money to buy a fuel so it was <laughs> very very uh, difficult uh, period and uh, slowly uh, they have been forced uh, to work purely like scientists, which was mm -hmm. a bit difficult for those guys because for them, the main target wasn't to be PhDs, all those things, to write, write the papers. Their task was to help uh, uh, shipyards to make more advanced designs. So uh, that's why I left. I went to Italy and uh, those guys on the end, the uh, Ministry of Science decided that they don't have enough, I don't know, publication, what happened. I didn't feel, uh, follow up and uh, they uh, stopped to exist, which was a very sad story because they managed in that time, in that country to, to I don't know, to make a lot of successful projects. In my time, we also did something like uh, reconstruction of pedal wheel a mm -hmm. ship that belongs to the king before uh, World War II and, and some other projects. But always uh, um, uh, we faced obstacles and obstacles were related to lack of uh, finance, lack of money to complete. Uh, I wasn't expecting such depth within your first role. So the six years you spent in uh, Sasa until 2004, first of all, from what you're saying, they gave you a very overall experience of what it is to be a naval architect. You were not uniquely working on a specific type of vessel. Um, and then you went, as you said, to Italy to work as a research uh, assistant. And then yes. you further developed your educational portfolio by gaining your PhD as well in Denmark. Yeah, I did PhD in, in Denmark. So uh, what was the purpose of doing your PhD? What were you trying to do through it? Uh, OK, so what's happened? Uh, there basically I figure out uh, already in that time that uh, no matter of the problems in uh, in ex Yugoslavia that they <laughs> ruined the country and the economy, uh, that uh, there is uh, a change in the Europe, and that just being uh, being naval architect who works in shipyard who design ships is something that is not going to be so possible. Basically, maybe you can do it uh, in in one place in Italy, mm -hmm. in a couple of places in uh, Germany, one in France, one in uh, up in uh, in Finland, but usually that's it. And this is very, very, we could say, um, small, uh, uh, small number of yards when uh, where you can work. That's why uh, I, I, I got interested in um, in uh, programming and in uh, data acquisition and analyzing mm -hmm. the data. So already there, I said, ah, this is what I want to do. I was young and I said, uh, OK, um, and my salary wasn't good enough, <laughs> to be honest. And then I said, OK, let's let's learn programming. Uh, since in high school I was in some uh, department for mathematics and, and informatics, so I had some foundation how to program. I knew some of the older programming languages. And then I said, OK, let's let's learn C, C++ uh, and try to make uh, monitoring systems. And uh, then I moved to C Sharp. Everything was intention to do this and to propose to 
uh, to the management uh, of uh, this institute to say, OK, this is something that we can do because I didn't want to sit and to wait and somebody else to solve my problem. I said, I will learn, I will propose, I can do it. Uh, <laughs> and then instead of to do there, uh, I, I met an um, extremely good friend of mine. He, he unfortunately, he is not alive anymore, Professor Antonio Tiano. And uh, I told him what I'm trying to do. And he, he was professor of uh, control, of automation control. And he said, ah, Zoran, uh, I will get uh, an European project. Uh, it will be about um, a control and monitoring system for small uh, unmanned underwater vehicles or small submarines. Do you want to come to Italy at University of Pavia to work with me? I said, yes, I will be so happy. And then one day he called me and said, ah, Zoran, OK, everything is fine. You can come. But I didn't get money for uh, submarines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got the money for wine fermentation. Are you see still interesting? I said, OK, let's go. I want to learn about monitoring systems. I will learn from you how to do mm -hmm. it for the wine. And later on, I will apply this on the ships. So that was the idea. <laughs> I went there. So so this is what led you to becoming a lead vessel uh, performance analyst. I'm sure you did. Did you get immediately into the role of the lead performance analyst, or did you start from a lower uh, uh, no, no, position? No, no, uh, no. Yes, I will. I will. Yes, I, I started from the lower. So okay. basically, but they didn't have a grades at uh, at the very mm -hmm. beginning. So basically, what's happened? So I worked with Antonio. Then I got offered to go to Denmark. One my friend was PhD student uh, with a very famous professor, Junker, uh, uh, Jorgen Junker Jensen. He's very famous for uh, CQP. I know, I know him, yes. Yes, he, he was uh, one of my supervisors. And, uh, okay. and then uh, uh, my friend was uh, his student and he said, ah, I like uh, what you did. Uh, I think you guys there are getting good foundation in Belgrade. Uh, do you have some good friend? And since I was a good student, uh, she called me and said, do you want to meet? And I went to meet uh, Jorgen and uh, Urlik. Urlik was, on the end, mm -hmm. my main supervisor. Um, he was younger and they said, OK, we, we will do like we need a guy who knows programming, a bit about of, about control engineering, some knowledge, and basically um, and the naval architect. So task will be uh, system. Uh, it is related to sea keeping. So basically it was the whole idea was to use ship uh, wave buoy analogy and mm -hmm. to estimate directional sea state based on the ship movements. So and then when I was about to leave, Antonio told me, ah, my good friend Mons Blanke and Mons Blanke is a sort of guru for uh, control uh, engineers. Very, he, he's really incredible guy, very famous professor. Mm -hmm. uh, he just made uh, recently a few days ago some autonomous uh, um what is the name um uh, ferry for uh, in denmark in some um he's not very like here for going to die i have, I have to something. go and look him up I, yes. I, I don't know i don't know the person yeah i have to go look him up yeah he wrote also very nice uh, books uh, and um he said he's a good friend of mine he's also at dtu maybe you can talk to him as well to help you and then mm -hmm. Mons, when i met Mons, Mons said ah i want to be your third supervisor and then they agreed and then uh, Jorgen told me, OK, go and take all, almost all the courses uh, there at uh, control and uh, electrical engineering, not now to learn something that you already know and basically come back and implement something. Could you bring some knowledge from control guys to naval architects in order to make something new? And this is how, how we started. So after this, I moved to Maersk. And in Maersk, I started like a performance analyst. So basically, mm -hmm. my boss, uh, my boss was uh, uh, Jakob, uh, uh, Jakob Bus uh, Peterson. I think this is his last name. <laughs> I'm getting old. I, I met Jakob uh, a couple of months ago, but I always call him Jakob. Yes, Peterson, Jakob. <laughs> and uh, and, um, and he, he was also a student of uh, Jorgen. A PhD mm -hmm. student, and then there was another man, uh, Christian Bendix Nielsen, who was also student. Yes, indeed. So it was a good 
team of several PhDs. At some point, we had five PhDs uh, in uh, in performance department. So I started as performance analyst, and then they said, OK, in Maersk, we want to make some grades, uh, you know, to see who is what. And uh, they gave me to be a senior performance analyst. Mm -hmm. They appreciated all my previous knowledge work from from Belgrade, from Italy, and they said, OK, you know different things, you're senior. And then I worked hard and uh, I became a lead performance analyst. Uh, I think that uh, maybe because unit was MMT, Mask mm -hmm. Maritime Technology now is, um, there is no MMT anymore because there is, I think they change a bit holding. Uh, so um, maybe I was first a foreigner that had this title uh, lead uh, lead engineer, not because they didn't want to keep the foreigners, no, not at all, but, but when mm -hmm. I joined the company, there were not so many uh, foreigners uh, in MMT in, uh, in engineering department, and over time now in Maersk you, you have a lot of foreigners now. Uh, now Danes are not majority. I think Indians are now uh, the highest. Um, uh, how how you say the majority in the company. The majority. Mm -hmm. Yes, the company really tried to. Um, they like diversities. They they want to encourage to have different people, mm -hmm. different cultures. Um, but, but to be honest, when you are an engineer, there are not really different cultures. <laughs> we are all the same. You know, there were people from many countries when I was about mainly from Europe, but all of us were so similar. Uh, my question to you is because you, you worked in AP Moller uh, slash Maersk for uh, five and a half years. So, yes, so, yes almost he, six. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are the technical skills? you developed in order to climb the, the ladder within this company? OK, um, uh, what helped? Uh, <laughs> really, that was uh, PhD. And, PhD and PhD that was basically uh, something that company could see as something useful. Mm -hmm. That was because uh, my PhD uh, has been uh, financed by a Danish center of maritime technology. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, the official name. Now, I, I mean, I cannot put my hand in, in, into the fire that this is official name, but I think it, it was mm -hmm. something like this. So, uh, uh, Maersk also participated, and uh, therefore it was Maersk, uh, it was Force Technology. So basically, that's why they, uh, they knew from the very beginning what I'm doing. And uh, they knew that um, this knowledge could be could be implemented. Uh, plus, uh, basically, it was also, for example, in Maersk, they check a psychological profile. You should fit into. I mean, this is what every uh, everywhere is happening. Mm -hmm. um, people should fit uh, into the philosophy of the company, and uh, and also, for example, when when I have to uh, hire a new colleague. And for me also is very important attitude, uh, psychological profile to know how this person will fit because young people are usually smart people. You, you cannot be stupid and be a naval architect. So it's not, not so important if somebody, I don't know, is coming from University A or B uh, or he did this or that. It is very important. Uh, um, uh, his attitude, personality, is this person really willing to work? Could this per person uh, collaborate uh, with his colleagues? This is this is very, very important. Also, it's important to have, um, this is a big difference, uh, especially um, with, with the movies, uh, when you see the movies. In the movie, they say, ah, you go to your uh, to possible employer, and demonstrate that uh, you are very confident that you know you go there and tell them I will save uh, 10 millions of dollars for you and then they say oh yes and they give you position no it, it is not like this uh, it is even better to be modest especially in in Scandinavian type uh, of companies you know it's better to be modest to to demonstrate that you are willing to listen to your colleagues that you are not arrogant uh, because if you are not modest you cannot advanced in your career because then you are 
happy <laughs> with yourself. You say, oh, I'm I'm smart guy and that's it. I don't need anything. I don't care about the opinion of other people. And this is wrong. You should say, no, I'm not uh, good enough. I know that I'm not good enough. I have to learn. I have to share uh, uh, things that I know with uh, with uh, the things knowledge with my colleagues. And uh, and this is this is a proper way. So you actually need an intern or, or a young person that you can actually teach because if they don't have the capacity to learn, they're useless. Yes, exactly. Uh, basically, uh, exactly. You, you, you need a young guy who is very interesting in working, in learning and, and who, who is willing to listen to other, other people and then to mm -hmm. share the knowledge. Being arrogant is, is very, very wrong. You know, that prevents you also in your life to to listen to other people, to to get something because talking to other people, listening to them, you can gain something. If if you're too arrogant, if you don't want to to listen to anything, then but it is I know that for many people this is a challenge. So mm -hmm. maybe something that um, you can learn or you can work on yourself. You know, even if you have a big ego, you can try to control it. <laughs> of course. Uh, can we talk about Thanamares, your transition yes. to Thanamares? How did that happen? Yeah, basically, uh, I remember it was Friday and I got a LinkedIn message. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in gym with my wife. I said to my wife and because I was thinking, OK, maybe I wasn't sure if this is really something, uh, if they are really serious, you know, mm -hmm. because you know how it works is not typical that uh, Greek companies uh, goes to uh, abroad to find people, you know, is yes. uh, uh, they do this mainly for top management, you know, this is, but not really, you know, to find experts, etc. And uh, And she said, no, no, I want to go to Greece. Uh, here is the code, <laughs> and uh, and that's why I started talking to them, and uh, they arranged everything. They were super super efficient. Uh, in in the very same moment when I said yes to Tenamaris, I don't know, a few weeks or something like this, I just woke up in in Athens with all my stuff uh, brought by actually Maersk container ship and in apartment that they found for me and so uh, all this uh, they found school for my daughter so they were very 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 uh, efficient mm -hmm. it's a it's a very interesting story it sounds as like you, you you dreamt of it and you woke up the next day and you and you were living it so yeah, almost, almost like this they were really effective their mm -hmm. hr is is really good can you talk to me about the most challenging part of your role. So does it have to do with profitability or uh, structuring workflows or safer operations? What's the most challenging part of your role as a senior performance engineer in Tenamaris? What was the hardest part? OK, uh, in, in Tenamaris, mm -hmm. uh, basically ah, there I wasn't lead because they didn't have leads. <laughs> senior was their job. <laughs> so I accepted to be senior in order to go to hot country and to country where uh, where is nice uh, to be, you know, because mm -hmm. people are paying a lot of money to come to to spend just a couple of weeks uh, during the year in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, there, basically, uh, their department was brand new and uh, and uh, it, it wasn't so clear for them what are they supposed to do this is because it's not that um, it's not like Maersk in Maersk uh, they started with performance uh, somewhere in 70s uh, because um, uh, late uh, uh, Mr Muller uh, sorry Mr Maersk McKinney Muller Mr Muller was his father uh, he, he he wanted uh, ships uh, to to be always on time. And basically the whole idea wasn't uh, energy efficiency and saving the fuel was to make sure that ship will call harbor when the ship's supposed to call harbor, not to have delays. That's why in, in the in the Maersk system, uh, I don't know if uh, if my colleagues changed something in, in last few years, 
But for example, instead of to deal with power percent, resistance percent, to see uh, how many percent uh, how and propeller are above, the baseline uh, they they dealt with speed percent because that was traditional thing. They wanted to make sure that the vessel will reach a certain speed. So basically, but on the end, it is the same thing if you deal with speed with mm -hmm. speed percent power percent resistance percent on the end is the same uh, thing so basically there was okay it was something totally new for them i had to help them to to understand uh, okay what is uh, how to establish this department how they should uh, what is uh, what they need to begin with and uh, so that was one challenge because it was something mm -hmm. brand new. But second challenge was uh, also also mentality. Uh, and uh, and this challenge was uh, extremely that was a significant challenge uh, because. Um, basically, in, in the old days um, here in Attica area, let's let's use this term. Um, the most of the owners, they sailed uh, for charters, so their focus focus um, hasn't been on um, on uh, uh, saving the fuel on uh, on, on having uh, extremely high energy efficient vessel because they haven't been responsible for paying the fuel they sell for the charter charter was the one who paid the bill that's why their focus was more on order for example from engineering point of view to make sure that ship will sail if the ship is old to have very good superintendent that will be able to maintain this ship. So it was idea to have everything up and running. OK, so continuous operation, not really efficient operation because it wasn't uh, the nature of the business was different. Nowadays uh, is totally different game uh, now. And, and plus uh, Greek fleet was old fleet, you know, in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Now, Greek, so they needed super good superintendents. Mm -hmm. Now, Greek fleet is, I, I believe, the best fleet uh, in the world. It is the, most it is the best fleet in the world. The best shipyards, the best vessels. So everything is really, really, you know, at high standards from technical point of view. Mm -hmm. So focus is not so much. You don't need a magician to be superintendent, uh, even less experienced guy could solve this, plus uh, companies like MIN, um, basically they will solve a, a lot of problems. You cannot even do things on, on your own, many of those. And uh, and now uh, they also sail on spot market. So now mm -hmm. owners are paying uh, for the fuel bill. So now it's very important with such a good ships to have uh, also very efficient business. So it's very important, uh, plus, um, uh, also with all those uh, regulations about emissions, even if you if your vessel is chartered out, still is important to have very, very uh, efficient uh, vessel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and plus uh, also why not to save uh, fuel for the charter? Because then uh, your reputation will be much better. And they will be much more willing to to work with you. You know, so it is it is combination of all those uh, parameters. And now if I if I'm right, uh, the most of the ship owners are trying to to make uh, energy efficiency or performance departments. Yes. Now we are changing the name from performance into energy efficiency in order to be more fancy and mm -hmm. more comprehensive. That's why I think uh, this is the future for young naval architects, because I think that many, many ship owners will need this. Still, there are not a lot of experienced uh, people in uh, in Athens in this field mm -hmm. because it wasn't important in the past. So that's why it was when I started with the Maris, was a challenge for the people to understand what we are doing and why we are doing this, you know. Mm -hmm. The environment you're working in, it's a very dynamic environment. It's it's not a stable environment per se, not in a negative way. Have you encountered any any crisis that you had to deal with? Maybe in your role as a head of fleet performance as well. Mm, okay, 
show basically uh, what is uh, if, if you think a bit basically okay uh, when you do performance energy efficiency we don't have this like uh crew man is injured we have to save mm -hmm. him or you don't have like um, something like uh, engine failure that must be fixed right now because the whole idea of the performance is that you analyze the data that you make trends and that already in advance you know when the problem will appear actually mm -hmm. the problem already started developing and you just uh, should organize um, a proper moment when you are going to solve the problem you know if the ship is fouled a ship will not get fouled um, you know instantaneously so there's it no live like a, data performance tracking then there's no live performance tracking no no it is live no oh it is live it is live. Okay. live high frequency you cannot mm -hmm. do it with stupid uh, noon data because the noon data are not accurate mm -hmm. you must use high frequency data you must uh, do all use the best knowledge not from naval architectural point of view only this is very important to build the models but you should also use all the knowledge from data science in, and you should combine because this field is a bit more difficult because you have to combine data science with naval architecture because the best way is to combine models to have physical models and advanced uh, data science instead of for example to make purely statistical models so what is done by some commercial companies uh, that don't have naval architects at all no you need live data you need a lot of data but then thanks to those data you should know what's going on and sh you should be able to predict for example your consumption is increasing now is three percent above you see the trend and you know when it will be 10 percent for example and 15 and then that gives you time to arrange for for example if it is how for how uh, inspection and cleaning to say okay should they do it in us where is 50k i don't know or excess consumption is small and they can do it in singapore which is where is three times less you know so you mm -hmm. need to use data and to make smart choice you could make a business case to say should they spend 50k now or have a small leg with a bit uh, over consumption three four five percent and then do it in a more convenient harbor mm -hmm. you know you just calculate five percent more of fuel price of cleaning you know that's why you need high high frequency data you need a very accurate data in order but why this work is stressful uh, mm -hmm. So from this point, like ah, it's not stressful. No, nobody will go there to fix the engine. No, but it's, uh, it is extremely stressful because in those cases, okay, there is a problem with the engine. Uh, you will send uh, people, and and it will be fixed. It will be solved. You know. Um, but in in case of performance, your ship is two thousand nautical miles away from you. Mm -hmm. You have to to see to find out what is the cause of underperformance and then uh, you should uh, ask technical department and operation to act uh, accordingly so you say my ship is fouled ship will call uh, in 10 days or in five days singapore please arrange everything for the cleaning because i see 15 percent of uh, excess consumption of the fuel and if your ship is not clean uh, green if it is not fouled, mm -hmm. they will be no trust. You know, they will say they're stupid. <laughs> they don't know what they are talking about. And and this is maybe the only um, job for naval architects where you have just based on the figures really to assess and to, I cannot say predict, mm -hmm. but to find out, to estimate what's going on. Nobody else uh, has this kind of job, you know. Other, okay, there is a problem with the engine. Okay, we will send the people, we will fix it. Problem with the pump, you know. But here, if if there is something, that's, that's why I told you why you need the best uh, system, why you need very accurate data, high frequency, enough data, you know, to make a conclusion. Because if you say vessel is fouled, vessel must be fouled. If it is not fouled, then people will not trust you anymore and to your team. 
So precision is ex it's extremely important within your industry. Yes, also, I, I understand that liaising with different teams, so efficiency uh, within teams is very important and communication. It, it is extremely, extremely important. Plus, basically, if you think a bit, uh, so if we forget on on scientific institutes, on towing tanks, uh, on uh, plus societies, if we are focused on ship owning companies, this is, uh, I think, at the moment, uh, the only position uh, for naval architects where you really need all your knowledge from hydrodynamics, uh, from uh, propulsion. You know, you don't need this for um, a classical role of superintendent. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I believe that being, a, you know, performance analyst or energy efficiency analyst is more interesting. You can use more your knowledge and still working for for the ship owner not going to design office or you know to a scientific institution and it's something new you have a chance to build something new uh, to create history okay we are not creating <laughs> history but you know it is new pretty mm -hmm. new field so there is a lot of room for improvements especially for young people they they, they could do a lot of things did you have the ability to induce such growth as well in your final role, your most recent role in Angelicus's group as well? Yes, 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 yes. Basically, uh, uh, I joined uh, Angelicus's group more or less something like um, almost six years ago, I think. It was in June uh, 2017. And uh, basically in Maran Tankers, Mm -hmm. uh, they um, wanted really to uh, to increase the efficiency of the vessels and to deal uh, with um, with uh, uh, vessel performance on on, on I could say scientific way and on or on a proper way. That's why uh, basically they offered me this position. And uh, the idea of the owners uh, was uh, that one day. Uh, we will expand from um, tankers if we manage to prove ourselves uh, to dry and on the end uh, to gas. So basically to do performance for all three companies that we are doing mm -hmm. now. So but uh, we could say that um, demand uh, was uh, biggest for uh, for tankers because they were on the spot. Uh, they also were dealing um, with charterers who really wanted to know what's going on. Uh, and uh, and this is how it started. So to build uh, our department. Mm -hmm. And from one company to take second and on the end, the third one. You placed a lot of attention, especially for young people on the energy sector. Now it, it, it is a trend. Everyone is trying to veer to the net zero approach. Every company is trying to do that. So having that factor in mind, what kind of advice would you give to a recent graduate, a naval architect in 2023? What should they look for within your sector to become a very competent professional? OK, so what is important now? I will make uh, it seems that over time I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so I'm making some uh, small introductions, but uh, basically uh, this is also what I wanted to tell you. In order mm -hmm. to, to do this, uh, we got uh, absolute support from the owners because, uh, as, as you said, it is like very noble uh, company and the owners are really noble, noble mm -hmm. ship owners, uh, extremely open minded. And then uh, we got uh, their support. Uh, for building uh, not only department, but our own performance system, because I was against of buying performance system, commercial one, because in Maersk, my task was also one of the tasks to develop a Maersk performance system. So we got all the support from the owners to build um, in-house, very advanced. We try to be very advanced. We even published several scientific papers. Uh, performance system in order to uh, analyze uh, analyze our vessels and to decide uh, action. So without good performance system, there are no savings because if you if you cannot quantify them, there are no savings. What are savings if, if you are not aware of this? You're not even aware of the losses unless uh, unless some charter is 
is behind you and uh, you know grabbing you for the neck. So basically, this is the core mathematics uh, modeling very good performance system where you can implement all your knowledge from hydrodynamics, from also from engine part, you know, and then you are able to quantify. So now I'm going back uh, uh, to to your question. Um, nowadays, in order to develop the system, basically, you is not that now naval architects will start in programming everything. No. We make prototypes, uh, small pilots. We see what is the, the best, etc. And usually we do this uh, in in Python. Uh, you know, then we try. We do in Python, and then when everything is fine, when we are super happy, uh, then uh, we write specification, add uh, attach also code for Python, and uh, send uh, this uh, to professional uh, software developers because you want very efficient software. You want guys mm -hmm. who are able to optimize the software. And therefore, besides being only naval architect, knowledge from data science and uh, some knowledge, not extreme, is more important data science, but also knowledge from uh, computer programming will help a lot. So not like to do C++ <laughs> what mm -hmm. they did, because this is like overkill, but mm -hmm. Python, MATLAB, all those things will help to build uh, some prototypes, to check your ideas, and then data science. So basically, if uh, the students could select also some courses from data science, change detection, fault detection, uh, some advanced statistics will help a lot because mm -hmm. we really try here. Uh, basically, I, I support this, I could say, MERSC School of uh, Performance where we build physical models, models based on the naval architectural knowledge mm -hmm. and combine this knowledge with uh, advanced uh, statistics. So basically, if one would like to have not only one master, but two, data science will be will be good idea, basically, or PhD, PhD to be combination between data science and uh, naval architecture. Basically, this is what what I did, but it is not that I really had this vision. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do those things, but it is also how, you know, I got this opportunity. Life, uh, I just, uh, I can say I followed the stream, but I was lucky. I was lucky to get uh, this kind of, uh, of, of a PhD project. Yes, to be honest, your PhD, I wanted to mention this as well. Your PhD and the C++ you got to know, they were future proof skills it's as if you predicted what's going to happen in the in the future so what i keep from from us hard skills for students it's first of all uh, data science that's very important python knowledge matlab may i add simulink as well modeling i think oh yes 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 exactly exactly no matlab and simulink are all very good and and in in principle uh, i believe that for prototypes they mm -hmm. they would be even better than python because you can do it uh, faster, you know, but on the other hand, uh, it's not that big companies will pay now, you know, that's why we don't uh, deal with MATLAB now to buy license for MATLAB, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the like, uh, it will be like, OK, guys, why why MATLAB? You know, uh, not only here in in Maersk, in, in Tenemars, whenever you go, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why uh, Python seems like uh, Good opportunity also maybe because in in matlab everything is prefabricated <laughs> sometimes <laughs> some functions are black box i they're not really black box but you will not really try mm -hmm. to deeply understand and in python maybe you have to do more things on your own even though that you can use existing uh, libraries okay c sharp um, mm -hmm. is good but c sharp means um, um, that you need to buy somewhere some libraries for statistics, you know, not to build everything by yourself. Plus, it is, uh, we could say, professional software developing uh, platform of, of Microsoft. If it is Microsoft C Sharp, they invented, then it will be very expensive. So basically, you know, the best is Python, which is open source and you, which is open source and you need it for prototypes only. And then the guys will do in in uh, some very professional software, real developers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. Logic, I I want to tell you that this was very informational for me as well, because I am trying to find my steps in the industry and see what I like. 
I very much like the pressure you're under. It may sound negative to some students. I like the, the element of challenge. Mm -hmm. So it gives me an idea of what I want to pursue in the future as well. I because I was thinking of my masters and what I want to do. So uh, I think the article is going to be very beneficial to students. I'll make sure to do even more research so that the article is very precise and gives a very good insight into your field. But you gave me already a lot of information. Thank you so, so much for your valuable time. It really means a lot for a young student like me to listen to a professional like you. Yeah, you so you're very, you. very welcome. You're very welcome. Basically, uh, also Professor Antonio Tiano helped me. So this is uh, how it goes. Yeah. Maybe this is also my way to thank to him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, when when uh, you are done with your thesis, I will be very happy to to see what uh, what you wrote, what you try to do. If you have uh, ideas or wishes to come back to Greece, uh, you you should contact me. You never know what will happen. Maybe in that case, I will not have any. <laughs> any free you know um, uh, places because it is like this you never know of you course, never know. Of, course and, uh, of course and and one more thing for the for the students uh, also because mm -hmm. this is what was my mistake for many years so basically you work on yourself you are very good you earn some knowledge and then you see job ad like ah oh, is job posting they ask for this this and this and, this, and you say oh but i'm much better i'm much better than what they need so i will apply and they're going to take me for sure. And and unfortunately, th this will not happen. And it is not just what they say in the movies. You are overqualified is is even more practical. For example, mm -hmm. uh, I got a, a certain not me, for example, some manager, a certain budget for new employee. Mm -hmm. And if you are somebody with a way uh, higher experience, it, it does not mean that uh, this manager will manage to get uh, some uh, to get a bigger budget because you will be not happy with uh, this small price and and uh, salary and and even they would believe that it's not good to underestimate you to give you the lower salary and this works exactly like this if the company say okay here we don't have company's car but somewhere they have it like you could have company's car you have a money to buy fiat mm -hmm. and you say ah oh, yes but I, I found bmw it is much better car and they say yes it is much better but <laughs> you got money for fiat yes but this one is better yes but you have money for fiat so this is how it is when, when you when the people search for a job it's a good idea to see if they really match uh, to to these requirements and to the profile that is a great analogy and this is a mistake that i have personally done and a lot of my friends as well so i thank you so much for the for the advice I will follow it a hundred percent. Thank you. All the best. Have a nice evening. No, no worries. Have a nice evening too. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.